My discussion today is going to be quite radical, but it's one that I think that we need to have, and it is this. Today, in the United States, we live in an age of anti-whiteness. In our universities and sundry institutions, calls for the abolition of whiteness and the annihilation of white people have become increasingly common and acceptable. Indeed, a University of California at Berkeley professor recently told his students that abolishing whiteness means wiping out all white people. Now, I write as a mixed-race black Jamaican-American independent conservative and one who is deeply troubled that the racist and misanthropic immoral principles that were used to keep blacks outside the pantheon of the human community are being inversely applied to white Americans today. I write as a trained ethicist and from a deep center of moral gravity. I live in a country I love passionately as a naturalized citizen. I came here as a legal immigrant, as many of you know, in 1985 at the age of 20 with just $120 in my pocket. I arrived in Atlanta with nothing but ambition, tenacity, grit, perseverance, honor and a belief that I was owed nothing by anyone, and a belief in the American dream and a deep calling to make America a better place. I lived in a predominantly Klan neighborhood because it was cheaper to do so than to live in the city. And I was employed by uh, admitted uh, Klan employers. I worked up to 45 hours a week, um, allocating my time among three jobs to, my, to put myself through school before winning a scholarship to pursue a PhD in philosophy. And as an undergraduate, I did graduate magna cum laude in classes where I was mostly the only black student in all white classes. And as the only black student in my PhD program, which I completed in four years, I defended my dissertation with distinction and in both my undergraduate and doctoral classes, all my professors were white, with the exception of one person. Now, I did then, as I do now, love America from, I think, a lot more than the country of my birth. I believe in the goodness of the American people. And after having, I would say, visit roughly around 35 countries and spent much time in Europe, South America, Asia, and after having lived in two Europe, European countries for a year at a time, Americans are still my favorite people in the entire world. I think they are the most charitable and benevolent folks I have ever had the privilege of knowing and loving. And this country has brought me where I am and I will spend my life defending it and its magnificent and innovative people. So let's have a conversation about this topic when we return I am Jason Hill. This is The Jason Hill Show. And if you are a fan of The Jason Hill Show or an admirer of the show and you'd like to make a contribution, please click on the link below and follow the instructions. We do appreciate your contribution to the show and it helps a lot. Welcome back to the show. This is Jason Hill, and uh, you are listening to The Jason Hill Show. A growing majority in our great republic is guilty of what I would call Americophobia and of rampant Christophobia. In schools that are currently steering children in the state of California, for example, to pay homage to Aztec gods through its ethnic studies curriculum because the white Christian god students are forced to worship is regarded as racist and patriarchal. Now, our culture is so balkanized by identity politics that we are witnessing an America where, for example, a black American national youth poet, Amanda Gorman's inaugural poem, The Hill We Climb, cannot have a poem of her choice translated by a white non-binary Dutch poet or any white translator in Europe or the United States because a phalanx of black activists believe that only someone who fits Gorman's racial profile should translate the poem. 
So government's agency and autonomy have been expropriated. Now, I make the latter statements not to be hyperbolic. As of this writing, government has deferred all commentary to her representatives. And what is important to note is that government approved, personally chose the white Dutch translator, Mariek Lucas Regenevel, to translate her poem. And white writers are routinely prohibited from authoring works about individuals that fall outside the ambit of their racial ascriptive identities. So we are witnessing the resegregation, for example, of dormitories, cafeteria spaces, and the granting of separate graduation ceremonies for blacks and Latinos in now over 70 colleges in the United States because black students claim they are triggered by the sight of white people and need a separate space from them. Racial sensitivity workshops that implicate all white people as racists for being white are conducted in order to rehabilitate them and reverse their racist tendencies. A plethora, or uh, more than a plethora, just a multiplicity of universities are coming under increasing pressure from black students to relieve them of the burden of having too many, quote, white people on campus. You can just Google, just Google this, and you'll find this information on the internet. And many white progressives and black activists and corporations led by white executives have joined the call to abolish whiteness, which is a a euphemistic term for exterminating white people by means of various methods. So from Coca-Cola's corporate mandate for its employees to be less white, which includes being more humble, less excellent and punctual, less prideful, less confident, less certain, less arrogant, to the proliferation of mental health journal articles lamenting the absence of a cure, a cure for, quote, parasitic whiteness, to diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives which systemically paint whites as racist and oppressive and actively promote employment and promotion on the basis of race, non-white descriptive or non-white racial description, to Berkeley University professor Zeus Leonardo's non-apologetic statement that to abolish whiteness is to abolish white people, to school districts year-long anti-whiteness training to fight, quote, get this, hmm, curricular violence in math, a violence initiated, it is claimed, by white people, to a commitment by 100 and 60 Minnesota principles to decenter whiteness. Now, when you think of all of this, I maintain that the United States has become systematically anti-white, and this is just the tip of the iceberg. The plot to annihilate whites in America betrays a more sinister agenda, since our civilization is largely the construct of and by persons who are regarded as white, There is a nihilistic plot, I think, to destroy the creators and vanguards of Western civilization in order to plunder the states, the United States, into chaos. The end result is to change the political DNA of the nation in order to transform it on two fronts. To destroy it in the name of nihilism, because America is good, and it is a superlative value, and there are those who are motivated by hatred of the good for being the good. And the second motive is to annihilate the principles of Western civilization, hence the attack on enlightenment principles, on reason, on logic, and the idea of objectivity as the constructs of racist white imperialists in order to destroy the provenance of those allegedly discriminatory and oppressive principles, white people in general. As I'm going to discuss, there is no vehicle more comprehensively and systematically assaultative 
against the agency of whites than critical race theory. Critical race theory is detrimental to all persons in general. Uh, I would invite you to read an article that I wrote in The Federalist um, last year. Um, it was widely read that critical race theory truly aims to murder the souls of white children. Um, it is not only hate speech against whites, it is an incitement of moral and psychological violence against whites in general, and a pernicious form of indoctrination of students of color against their white compatriots. A consequence of this indoctrination can be seen in an op-ed in Campus Reform where a student demanded that voting privileges should be revoked from cisgendered white men. Now, from Afro-pessimists and Black nihilists and anti-racists such as people like Calvin Warren and Frank Wilderson III and Ibram Kendi, who called for the annihilation of whiteness and white people, whites will always owe black an incalculable debt that can't ever be repaid because whiteness constitutes an original sin, a blot and stain on humanity itself. So white privilege, we hear a lot of talk about white privilege, white privilege, which is unilaterally applied to all whites in general, is, in general is, is sort of interpreted as conferring an indubitable status of superiority on all whites at the expense of blacks. Such whites concomitantly have a preternatural ability to oppress all non-whites by virtue of retaining this privilege. But I think that even if white privilege turns out to be real, granted that any privilege ought to be regarded as a blessing in life, then what the hell are whites supposed to do about their white privilege? Democratize it? How? Be less white? How? Transfer it to non-whites? How? In what manner? I am deeply disturbed at the deterioration in race relations that is occurring and I think will only worsen as anti-white racism as an infectious idea pathogen takes hold in our culture. In its mildest form, uh, it will produce resentment and tension between the races. Among the radicals who express a genocidal impulse towards annihilating white persons, I believe this is a misanthropic and evil-growing pathogen that ought to be condemned for the intrinsic evil it is, and also for the direst of consequences it could lead to, which is outright violent conflict between the races. An attack on white people, which is an attack uh, against a race of people, um, I contend is a crime against humanity. No civilized nation can afford to tolerate the promulgators of such ideas or worse, the enactment of such ideas in, into policies, institutional mandates, and teaching curricula. Um, law enforcement officers actually shoot and kill more unarmed white men than they do black men in any actual year. You can look this up. This is... Uh, statistically true. Our media, however, remain silent about such rights violation. And there is growing anti-white racism directed especially at heterosexual Christian white males in our culture. Now, as a professor of 27 years who has, on two separate occasions, lived in Ku Klux, Ku Klux, Klan, Ku Klux Klan neighborhoods as a young immigrant and who as a young professor also taught impoverished college students at a university in which 90% of my students were Klan members. None of those students were privileged. I share, well, I could share my experiences um, with them over the period of a year and describe how I, how I went from teaching a contentious and rambunctious lot of students who had never had a Black instructor before, Black professor before, to 
creating a respectful space where I engage their deep humanity and eventually command in their respect because I tolerated no disrespect and no nonsensical or foolishness from them. And I refused to play the role of a victim when confronted with their behavior. I exhibited all the traits of a formidable but inspiring leader by letting them know that I would have them removed from my class if I detected even a patina of disrespect from any one of them. Yet I tutored them for free every weekend in my small cramped office on campus for three hours on Saturdays and Sundays. And I managed to bring all those who were failing my symbolic logic class, mathematical logic, to achieve a passing grades to an A. I brought everyone up to at least a B plus and most to an A. I never expelled them from the historical process or the domain of the ethical. I summoned the deepest core of my humanity and all that was humane in me to reach their moral core as human beings abstracted from their racist identities. Now, in the end, many of them wept bitterly when I left the university for another position. And no one, they said, not even their parents, had expressed such deep belief in their abilities to make something remarkable of their lives. And simultaneously, no one had, while subjecting them to strict disciplinary standards, made them feel that it was the behaviors that were being punished rather than the entirety of who they were. Anyone who is white should not be ashamed of being white or privileged, the latter simply being a blessing for which one should be thankful. I mean, I just think privilege of any form is a blessing, and if you're not thankful for your blessings, then that's just too bad. So I encourage listeners to adduce themselves of the utter nefariousness of the idea that to be white is to be automatically racist. If one has harmed no one of another race, then one must, with full implacability and intransigence, use one's individuality and agency to defend who one is, which includes the immutable characteristics that, that, that identify one as white. Now, if other members from other racial groups are permitted to do so, then by what inverted principle and logic should persons who are white be denied the right to defend their right to their embodied existence as white people? Now, to wit, Western civilization as we find it is actually for the most part the construction and creation of persons whom we may describe as white. It is only with full forethought of malice that one would wish to destroy the very people whose ancestors are responsible for the creation of said civilization and who themselves are the continued architects of Western civilization. Now, the motives of the anti-white racists are brought into sharper relief in this um, in this discovery. On the one hand, there is a, a visceral and irrational white phobia made evident in what I've stated, but most eloquently expressed by psychiatrist Aruna Kilani, who shared a fantasy while speaking to the Yale School of Medicine. And she said the following to great applause. Quote, she said, I had fantasies of unloading a revolver into the head of any white person that got in my way, burying their body and wiping my bloody hands as I walked away, relatively guiltless with a bounce in my step, like I did the world a fucking favor, close quote. Now this, I submit, is obscene and an example of pure evil. So white phobia, I submit, stemmed from the latter or the later and darker side of the civil rights movement that gave rise to victim studies or revolutionary studies programs that were fake disciplines and advocacy programs, starting with black studies and queer studies, women's 
studies, gender studies, post-colonial studies, Chicago, Chicano studies, I should say, and a plethora of subdisciplines that, in an essay written recently by Zeus Leonardo called Disorienting Western Knowledge, states the nihilistic goal of that era. And the goal of such victim studies programs was really to decolonize the mind from the shackles of the white man, in the words of Z. Susi Leonardo, quote, the decolonization movement is a knowledge project insofar as colonialism was an epistemological form of imperialism, close quote. He says the goals were to undermine reason and logic as proper means of adjudicating among truth claims by claiming that there was no such thing as an objective reality. So there were only lived experiences which could be countenanced by feelings and emotions. Blacks and other so-called marginalized groups were granted sovereign status on campuses and were free to delegitimize the methodology, the content, and the framing of the disciplines crafted by, quote, white imperialists. And we find that Black Lives Matter, critical race theory, diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives, wokeism, critical white studies are the new pagan religions and conceptual conduits through which systemic anti-white, anti-white racism is created, succored, and disseminated. Now, my experience in the classroom and with university administrators have shorn up the veracity of such motives. I received countless emails from university administrators asking if I have decolonized all my syllabi. That is, have I cleansed it of white European male thinkers? I've had students who have refused to read and study white European and American philosophers on my syllabus on the grounds that they were racists. And when I asked my students and students across the country, with whom I speak as I give lectures on my work and my books, what is it they want to achieve with their lives? The following answers are directed to me. Quote, to change the political DNA of the United States, to annihilate the country of its white patriarchy, and to rebrand it into a socialist regime. And very often these answers are coming from white middle-class students themselves. I have received complaints from several students at my own university where I have taught as a fully tenured professor for almost 23 years who are forced to write write essays on the topic, Why I Hate White People. Anti-white racists do not acknowledge, as we saw during the 2020 riots in the United States, the white abolitionists who fought against slavery or the thousands of thousands who died in the Civil War to free slaves. They do not see in reason that the 1964 Civil Rights Act was the third founding in American history in that it not only granted blacks equality before the law, but in violating the property rights of white citizens, it functioned as a moral eugenics program in making non-racists out of racist white people by outlawing racism. Whites could not use their property to discriminate against blacks. So the 1964 Civil Rights Act was designed to change the sensibilities of whites. As a result, we have a far less anti-black society than we had prior to 1964. Uh, Some students go as far as to say we need to return the entire continent, which they regard as stolen land, by the white man back to Native Americans. Well, I I just think this is a bunch of malarkey. I, I contend that the expansion of this country was made via purchases and treaties and war, and that there was a war for resources, and the Native Americans came in second. They lost the war. They just lost the war. It is to America's credit that those who may be regarded as war refugees were granted citizenship status via the 1924 Indian Citizenship Act. 
But perhaps one of my most controversial positions is the position that the open border globalists do indeed have an agenda. The willingness to allow millions or hundreds of thousands of undocumented immigrants to enter into a republic is part of a larger plan to accomplish two things. The first is to radically change the demographic of the country in a manner that will maneuver the migrant population into abject dependency on the state with the hope of translating that dependency into votes in favor of a far-left socialist regime. By default, this, given declining birth rates among whites in general, will result in the depletion of the white population. One cannot say with any degree of accuracy, if this is the primary goal of the anti-white cohort that make up the open border globalists. It is, however, a concomitant result of an open border policy that is putatively the agenda of the far left in a republic. Now, am I willing to defend the position that the encouragement and defense of porous borders is a surreptitious goal of the abolish white movement in a republic? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the solutions are varied. Um, the inverted racism against whites is quite pervasive. And I think of situations where while sitting on hiring committees, I've literally seen and heard colleagues pass over white males with master's degrees and native fluency in two languages for admittance into our PhD programs in favor of a mediocre black lesbian or a black person with a baccalaureate with an average GRE score. And they have said, we already have too many white men in the department. And once I reminded them that this is illegal to say or to, to practice, I'm just ignored. Yet they do have the good grace to tell white male graduate students this piece of pertinent information. As a white male, you're doomed. You should never have gotten into the humanities. So actually, we may extrapolate from the humanities to several other fields where white males are at a distinct disadvantage in various fields of employment. <clears throat> now, I say this without hesitation. Blacks, trans people, gays and lesbians, and Hispanics are the new sacred cows in our society. Institutions will bend over backwards to hire you if you're a mediocre black man today. Why? because black males are considered, endangered, are considered endangered species. If it's going to be okay to be white, I really mean it's quite all right to be who you are as you find yourself ensconced in your embodied humanity. You cannot change that. The nihilistic white genocidal movement spearheaded by blacks and whites have different motives and degrees. For many blacks, anti-white exhortations come on the heels for demand for reparations. And the demand for reparations is a response to a crisis of meaning in the lives of many Blacks living in an age of post-oppression. All their lives, their existence was forged in painfully oppressive conditions, and yet few claim to be real victims, largely, one could argue, because such talk had no moral traction in a world that did not take the moral suffering of black people seriously. But that changed with the civil rights movement and the passage of the 1964 Civil Rights Act and the 1965 Voting Rights Act. Voting Rights Act. All right, I've been talking for a long time. We're gonna take a short break. And when we come back, we'll consider the restorative and healing moment of the Civil Rights Act, but we'll also consider a little bit more about the systemic anti-white racism that is taking place in our culture. We'll be back in a moment. This is Jason Hill, and you're listening to The Jason Hill Show. Welcome back to the show. 
Martin Luther King did something restorative and healing to a nation's conscience. He played a significant role in not just embarrassing those who had not treated black suffering seriously, but also in refraining from morally damning those who were guilty of mistreating blacks. That is, he equalized the two juxtaposing faces of humanity, those of blacks and whites, and he reduced the moral proximal distance between them and equalized them. Their fractured humanity was made into a universal, moral, homogenous image. All human beings are deserving of equal treatment before the law. All are to be respected for their moral worth and shared humanity. King projected the image of a benevolent universe, and he sought neither revenge nor power nor dominion over whites. He sought moral parity and respect for all disenfranchised persons. And still that was not enough for some black Americans. Their existential angst began to set in, cushioning a pathological ethos that would seek to denigrate the dream that America was predicated on, not economic equality, but political equality. A haunting question threatened the psyche of many black Americans after the civil rights era, and it's, or it was, what do I do with my life when the deliverance quest for which I was searching finally has been delivered by the Republic of the United States? Once a state recognized black Americans as part of the sovereign mass, they did not disappear into racial anonymity. Welfare reparations made many of them into something really special. They became certified moral icons, icons stamped with a victim status, one that had the imprimatur of innocence. To retain that status, some sacrificed their dignity. They became economic supplicants of the state. Now, the cult of economic dependency has lasted for more than 57 years. It has drained many in the black community of their creative agency, eviscerated them of their dignity, and sent the life-denying message that one's fate and destiny lie outside of one's own hands, that one is not responsible for oneself, and that white Americans are responsible for one's salvation. It sent the message that misfortune represents a legitimate mortgage on the purse strings of others. For many black Americans who participated in great society programs, supplication became a performance game. Incompetence, weakness, and helplessness were showcased as ineradicable features of their identities. The entire agenda behind reparations, I believe, is to showcase one's dependence on others to procure help or sympathy. In doing so, black Americans place themselves as objects of mercy for public contemplation and obliterate any chance of achieving parity with their fellow white compatriots. Addiction to aid can become a mode of survival. Some people need a financial bailout, the object of whom becomes their moral redeemer. And the moral redeemer in this case is all too embarrassed and guilty. The all, the all too embarrassed and guilty white liberal who feels a sort of strange surge of power in his or her capacity to correct what is believed to be a cosmic injustice. So eager for redemption and atonement, this white emancipatory power shapes itself as supreme and its supremacy is addictive, seductive, unchallenged, and very white. For those white persons who are part of the cabal of the white genocide movement, their motives are a bit different. When a white University of North Greensboro professor defends CRT, critical race theory, and says, whiteness is a disease, this is not an issue about being on the right side of history or engaging in virtue signaling. Others like himself are the voices of authoritarian fascists who will be the last men standing to rule and govern the inchoate and amorphous mass of conceptually distorted individuals 
who will have destroyed our civilization. It is in such persons' interests to annihilate white people, and most notably white Judeo-Christian heterosexual white males, as a way of neutralizing all competitors in the war towards a new world order, what Mark Levin calls American Marxism. One will not see the establishment of a godless Marxist social order in the United States if there are predominantly white Protestant males vouchsafing or Judeo-Christian tradition. The anti-white cabal must discredit the ideas of the Enlightenment, the moral beauty of capitalism and self-reliance, the morality of wealth creation and individualism, along with patriotic love of country, healthy nationalism, and then attack the fountainhead from which such ideas have sprung. Now, contrary, I think, to the conceptual inanities mouthed by the punditry and commentariats, the great replacement theory is not a conspiracy theory. It is a common canard I have heard repeated among left-wing intellectuals in various venues. Self-styled revolutionaries as students and intellectuals have repeatedly said sanctuary cities will become breeding grounds for a new revolution. Organic eugenical systems that will breed the white population out of existence, especially if illegal immigrants are given the right to vote. And slowly over time, if stolen land is given back to their rightful, quote-unquote, indigenous owners. I remember asking one professor from another university, what would be the final outcome, the desired result of such political machinations? He replied sternly, as if his face were fixed for the confessional booth or for a prayer vigil. He said, to disenfranchise white people by divesting them of their land. Now, here are some solutions to anti-white racism. And some are personal and others are strategically political. I think in the moral division of labor, all battles, I think, can take place simultaneously. So I would advocate a four-year moratorium on all immigration. As an immigrant, I am staunchly pro-immigration for several reasons. I do think, however, that given the fact that our country has been inundated with millions of illegal immigrants, and further, given that this has been no accident, but rather a systematic attempt to both reshape voting patterns and habits by creating a vast dependent underclass and to overwhelm the white population, we must bear in mind a few considerations. A country with millions of undocumented immigrants who are not assimilated into the civic values of our, of our republic, but who live in parallel societies within our midst and have been targeted by a left-wing party as prime candidates for privileges and rights normally reserved for citizens, is an unspeakable state of affairs. Civic trust, social cohesion, and unification around core political values are the works that a political demos has to do to bring any legal immigrant into the pantheon of the American family. That such illegal migrants are outside the domain of this prerogative is untenable. The manufactured destabilizing effects of supporting hordes of illegal immigrants against the backdrop of political political actors who wish to cancel whiteness is untenable. So a moratorium on immigration would allow us to focus on addressing much of the manufactured chaos of the nihilists, open border nihilists, and the globalists. And we could tend to the seemingly insurmountable tensions we already face here in the United States regarding immigration. Now, the attack on white heterosexual Christian males is a symptom of what I call governance under a feminist gynocentric paradigm in which males are feminized and neutered. So masculinity in general is in crisis, 
and with the current gender pronoun, gender flipping, non-binary, emasculated, mostly upper and middle class white males who feel hatred for themselves. For being both males and whites, how will we maintain a strong military defense, for example? Know that woke culture has invaded our military with recruits being lectured on pronoun usage and Air Force officers being told that they are not to refer to their parents as mom and dad, we can see that manhood and maleness are being eradicated. So one moral solution against anti-white racism, especially in its virulent iteration of anti-white Christian male racism, is to embrace what I call ethical patriarchy. Now, moral patriarchy is fundamentally defined by three foundational principles. One, the capacity to provide. Two, the need to protect others. And three, the aspirational desire to leave a legacy. Now, these three foundations have been the bedrock out of which our stupendous Western civilization has been forged. It is a civilization built mostly by men, our civilization has been forged in the crucibles of the best within such men and from their noblest and most inspirational drives and identities. Today, those identities and drives and impulses are under attack. Masculinity and manliness, the twin attributes of patriarchy, are being criminalized along with vitality, exuberance, and displays of moral authority in men and young boys by a phalanx of radical feminists, woke progressives, and systemic nihilists. The goal of these forces is to advance a systemic nihilistic gynocentric paradigm that has ushered in an era that will destroy not only men, but civilization itself. Secular liberalism, which once entered the culture spheres in triumph, has now retreated in decrepitude. The results are in the maladies I have described that are destroying our civilization. I submit that nothing short of a return to a Judeo-Christian inflected patriarchal system of governance will restore our unprecedented American Republic and Western civilization, whose collapse seems almost imminent back to its rightful supremacy. Postmodern liberalism and secularism as systems of moral governance have expired. So I speak against the backdrop of school teachers who are telling parents not to gender their children and who are willing and who are telling their students not to use words such as mom or dad, but adult or grown up in class. I speak in a world often referred to as one governed by cancel culture that seeks to, among other things, decolonize college courses and strip them entirely of Western canonical thinkers to replace the genius of Shakespeare with the poetry of the rapper Jay-Z. We inhabit a country of multiple trans movements that are encouraging gender reassignments on children as young as eight years old and prescribing puberty blockers for preteens. And in this world, in this world, people can be fired from their jobs for misgendering a person. And usually it's white males who are fired and whose lives are ruined. This is a culture in which, in which postmodern ethical relativism is accepted as the norm in school, where students are taught that logic, reason, grammar, science, and no math are racist, that they are constructs of white imperial racists, and the social justice ideologies of Antifa and Black Lives Matter are being mainstreamed in the K-12 through curricula in schools in our republic. Islamic jihadists are lobbying for Sharia law to be applied within the borders of our country. The list could continue ad infinitum. What is clear is that there are two paradigmatic strands running concurrently in our country, the patriarchal paradigm and the gynocentric paradigm. They are philosophical antipodes. What I have just described are the symptoms of the gynocentric paradigm. Its ruling principles are radical egalitarianism, systemic nihilism, ethical relativism, 
the primacy of nature over technology, that is the environmental movement, feelings over reason, religious primitivism over ethical monotheism, chaos over order, and rulership of the tribe over the inviolate sanctity of the individual. The practitioners, male and female, of the gynocentric paradigm do not utilize just the politics of the radical left-wing Marxism to achieve their goals. The fundamental end of all those goals is to reverse the civilizational advancement of mankind, to return mankind to an atavistic, pre-modern, primordial level of existence coterminous with animality and nature so that man becomes indistinguishable from nature, and this will result in the annihilation of his moral identity. He will be reverted to a natural creature, voided of his inviolate moral worth, and separated from his Judeo-Christian God, from whom he derives moral law and authority. A necrotic lump of indistinguishable inorganic matter is a logical endpoint of this system a return to the imagined beginning of all human life. It is misanthropic. It embodies a hatred of man, of life, existence, progress, and of God. The Western patriarchal paradigm constituted by a need to protect others, to leave a legacy, and to provide is constitutionally incompatible with the gynocentric paradigm. Now, I claim that we have regressed to our current state for two reasons. The first is that the patriarchal paradigm has assimilated too much and ceded too much power to the gynocentric paradigm. Second, it has done so by means of its own creation. Political liberalism, which is now in revolt against Enlightenment values, out of white Western patriarchy has emerged the emancipatory movement that led to the abol abolition of slavery, the equal rights of women and blacks, and all previously disenfranchised people within its hemisphere, the rights of man, the birth of modern science, technology, capitalism, and an enhanced quality of life for millions across the globe. Paradoxically, the very liberties and rights language and freedom to conceive various ideas of the good and the good life for oneself led to various forms of relativism, nihilism, and agnosticism that paralyzed judgment and, above all, moral authority. So we must come to witness by way of historical examples of moral patriarch in action, beginning with Moses, how the first great patriarch in Western civilization functioned. From the wisdom of Aristotle, the father of logic, to the great Roman patriarch, such as Justinian, who codified Roman law under the Codex Constitutionum, to the Stoics, St. Augustine and Aquinas, to the Renaissance patriarchs and how they changed the world, to Gutenberg and Martin Luther, Da Vinci, Francis Bacon, Newton, Columbus, Galileo, the Scottish, German, and French Enlightenment fathers to Copernicus, Copernicus, Locke, Napoleon, Jefferson, the Founding Fathers. And we will see how each epochal figure throughout Western history functioned along the lines of the foundational patriarchal principles outlined. And we'll see that contemporary society is the indisputable legacy of these great moral patriarchs of the past. And if we look at this historical portrait, we'll be able to cull attributes of what a contemporary moral and heroic patriarchal figure ought to look like. This portrait will function as an aspirational model for young people to admire and respect, and such a figure will be a competitor to the vulgar and raking contemporary celebrity junkie who serves as the emulative model for a youth. Now, the excesses of liberalism, in part a gift of patriarchy, have left our society and, generally speaking, much of our world spiritually bereft, culturally bankrupt, and intellectually on the level of concrete-bound pre-modern humans. As one who writes in the spirit of the closing of the American mind, author Alan Bloom, who is also gay, I am committed to defending strong heteronormativity 
as a proper paradigmatic state any rational society must uphold because it is the only precondition for the propagation of the species. Now the dignity of gays and lesbians must be respected and their rights as individuals rather than as members of groups should be upheld. This is a given, this is almost axiomatic and doesn't really need that much debate. We're going to take another short break, our final break, and um, we'll continue our discussion when we come back. Welcome back to the Jason Hill Show. I'm Jason Hill. And remember, if you are an admirer of the show or you enjoy the show, um, please consider donating to the show by clicking on the link and following the instructions below. My reason conviction is that the social maladies that I have talked about are not the result of too much patriarchy, but rather from a dismal absence of ethical patriarchy. Now, whether it is third world nation states crumbling under the philosophy of the nanny state, the socialist ethos, which I think is a feminized leftist ideology, or fatherless boys committing a disproportionate number of crimes and rapes in America and across the globe, society will have to be radically de redesigned along traditional gender roles. This is fundamentally because men's natural role to lead with moral authority rooted in their biological natures has been usurped in the name of egalitarianism and equity. Patriarchy has lost its noble role because men have been made to feel irrelevant, disposable, and are systemically emasculated by an elite class of radicalized feminists and or beta males who have joined forces with them because they have been socialized to think that masculinity, male leadership, and male authority are synonymous with oppression. Or perhaps because they simply feel ambivalence about being men because they have weak fathers to begin with. The sensibilities of our young people will need to be reshaped in practical terms. I recommend, I think, a set of policies that will aid a more refined Republican mode of existence, at least here in the United States. And they include, under the auspices of strong men, abolishing all government schools and universities that promote anti-whiteness and the woke supremacy that bolsters it, granting tax credits to parents in order to give them greater choices and imbuing them with their own values and moral principles, granting tax exemption for families where mothers homeschool their children, the, the drastic reduction of or zero income taxes for families in which mothers decide to remain full-time at home to raise their children, applying severely punitive child abuse laws for tampering with the gender identities of children before they reach legal adulthood, defunding all private schools that spread anti-white race-based ideopathogens discontinuing all equity and affirmative action programs, instilling an ethos of law and order in all registers of society, teaching patriotism, civic virtues, pride in citizenship, and the concomitant responsibilities that ought to be exercised along certain rights, teaching students to see that moral male authority exercised in a household upheld by marriage functions with the same invariability as do the laws of nature. The moral patriarchal paradigm seeks to resurrect the human soul from the necrotic swamps, swampland to which it has been exiled. It seeks to remind human beings that when they stand in life and therefore before God, that at all times their proper posture facing him ought to be an upright one, the one that reflects the image in which he made them. My experience has been that most white males accept the anti-white male Christian invectives 
hurled against them in resentful silence. What they must do is assert their manhood and primal masculinity in a very unapologetic manner. Too many men function as beta males to a phalanx of appointed alpha bullies who cow them into feeling guilty and ashamed for being white, privileged, and male. They must assert their absolute ineradical nature of all three immutable features. They must never seek to engage in a reciprocal exchange to prove that because they're white, they're not a, they're not a threat and do not exist as a problem for non-white persons. This is a form of entrapment deployed by their adversaries to prove that any attempt to prove their innocence constitutes a presupposition on their part of some patina of guilt. They must, without fear of sounding arrogant and hubristic, remind their adversaries of the grandeur of Western civilization, which was largely built by European and American males, that their adversarial interlocutors are the legatees and beneficiaries of this heritage, and that the very moral and political vocabulary they use allegedly liberate themselves from so-called white domination are tools and weapons forged in the crucibles of liberalism, a creation of European white males. Conciliatory and solicitous behavior, I contend, are signs of weakness, appeasement, and moral compromise when dealing with people whose goals and intention are your complete destruction. Those who are the targets of anti-white racism must remember that a war is being waged against them in the name of some invented and artificial claim of oppression. Now, as I have painstakingly argued in my last book, What Do White Americans Owe Black People? Racial Justice in the Age of Post-Oppression. Blacks and other minorities have been living in an age of post-oppression since the passage of the 1964 Civil Rights Act, and whites must proclaim the obvious truth. People of color are not poor, and the ma vast majority do not commit violent crimes. They are victims of violent crimes. They are the victims of violent crimes. 80% of black Americans live above the poverty line and are not poor. Asian Americans are the richest economic group in America, earning an average 20000 a year more than white Americans. They must also remind the world that in the history of humanity, more whites have actually been enslaved than black Americans or black Africans. During the Barbary slave trade, Christian fishermen and coastal dwellers of 17th century Europe lived in constant fear of being kidnapped by Muslim pirates and sold into slavery by North Africans. Whites were enslaved under the Roman Empire by the Greeks and during several other epochs in human civilization. And as far as the African slave trade went, 90% of those shipped to the New World were enslaved by Africans, kidnapped, and then sold to Muslim and European traders. Without the complex business partnerships between African elites and European commercial traders, and commercial agents, the slave trade to the New World would not have been possible, not on the scale it occurred. Slavery existed in Africa hundreds and hundreds of years before the European slave trade began. From America's creation, there was never a successful slave revolt, but there was always a freedom movement for blacks led by white Americans who were ready to sacrifice their lives for it. Given the universality of slavery and the bigots among us, white Americans can be proud of their record on race and liberating black Americans from servitude. Today, the idea that white supremacy is systemic is a nefarious charge made against our country. It is an existential threat to our country and to our way of life, and it is ritually repeated by the White House itself. The major solutions to systemic anti-white racism are truth-telling, courage, and bravery, and an apologetic, unapologetic willingness to stand firm in the sacred embodiment of the image in which God has made one. It is to admit that we live in an age of mediocrity, lies, nihilism, and power struggles. 
What makes a state of affairs so evil is that it is young and innocent children who are used as pawns in this nefarious hate game. I think white Americans must continue to assert the unprecedented ex exceptionalism of the United States. In fact, all persons must do so, black or white, and to offer reasons why it still remains, as I argue, and will continue to argue, the most moral and freest country on the face of the earth. All human freedom, including that of enslaved African Americans, were forged in the pages of the United States Constitution and the Declaration by white founders who detested slavery, but were forced to make an awful moral compromise, lest the Confederate South, sided with England, provoked a war and defeated the North. Now, in closing, a friend of mine told me a true story that sounded apocryphal. He's an old-fashioned liberal and a strong advocate of public education. His story now constitutes a pedagogical practice in scores, dozens, hundreds of our nation's K-12 through schools. The COVID-19 lockdowns left him additional time to inconspicuously sit in on his sixth grade son's online classes. Now, one afternoon, he observed an assignment in an English class in which all the white students were required to place their arms beside a brown paper bag. The teacher, a white woman, asked if they noticed a difference in color between their skin and the brown paper bag. The white students verbally assented. The teacher then asked if the color of the bag looked close to the skin color of some classmates who identified as black. The teacher then announced, if your skin color is different from the color of the paper bag, then you are part of an American problem known as systemic racism that does irreparable harm to all black and brown people. Further, if you identify as white, you enjoy something called white privilege, which means you are practicing racism every day without knowing it. The teacher then went on to ask the class if they had ever heard of the term reparations. Out of some visceral paternal protection, my friend slammed down his son's computer and told him to go to his room. He told me that he stood there shaking with incredulity. I told him this is called murdering someone's soul. I told him his son was being held hostage by a new national philosophy called critical race theory, a moral eugenics program. His son was being re-socialized to be an enemy of his family, himself, and the state. The murder of his son's soul was taking place before his eyes. At age 12, this young man had committed no egregious harm against any black person, yet he was being taught to feel that he was the cause of all harms inflicted on black people. His son, I said, would grow to feel resentment towards blacks, and he would grow to feel self-hatred. By the power of his whiteness, he would cause much harm, yet also alleviate blacks' misery and suffering. He would be made to feel like a monster for holding that power. Simultaneously, he would be made to feel like the devil for not exercising this power to rectify every asymmetry between blacks and whites, regardless of whether the disparities were caused by racism. It would not be enough for him to not be a racist. He would have to prove that he was also an anti-racist. This child's curriculum would continue to include a phalanx of progressive nihilists who would call for the annihilation of whiteness, which his mind would come to understand as the annihilation of all white people, including himself. I told my friend his son ran the risk of not only becoming a racist, but a self-hating white supremacist. He would come to believe that becoming a white supremacist would be his only default position from which to protect his life from this assault, and all because he was being singled out because of the color of his skin. Whatever you call this, it's evil, and morally decent people of the world must fight against it. What we're witnessing by way of this story 
is the obliteration of the human capacity to function independently. We are witnessing the targeted spiritual destruction of a people by virtue of their race. And this spiritual destruction precedes physical extermination. To destroy one's moral autonomy by way of white shaming and guilt involves elevating the feelings and desires of one's destroyers above one's self and one's voice. Virtue here consists of incompliance, conformity, social adaptation, and obedience and the creation of a new master-slave duality. Now, I'm a moral humanist and a lover of humanity, and I think this is just morally wrong. Jason Hill Show is a project of the David Horowitz Freedom Center and Front Page Magazine. Unauthorized reproduction of this podcast without express written consent is prohibited.